Damien Chazelle's newest film is here, and it's a three-hour-long R-rated orgy of sex and drugs set entirely in old Hollywood. Just in time for Christmas. This review is brought to you by ExpressVPN. Go to expressvpn.com slash Merle to find out how you can get three months free and stay tuned after this review for more info. Hello, everybody, and welcome to my review of Babylon, which is hitting theaters starting today. This came into awards season with a huge amount of buzz, and that's not really surprising. It comes from Damien Chazelle. It is Damien Chazelle's fifth feature film, but his first as writer-director since La La Land briefly won Best Picture. Whiplash, of course, also an Oscar-winning film. So when you put together Damien Chazelle, the old Hollywood setting, a star-studded cast, well, you would think that the Oscars would start rolling in, right? Well, it may in some categories, but overall, I think that this movie suffers from a severe excess of excess, and that's ultimately where it ends up falling short. Babylon is set in Hollywood during the 1920s, a time that was apparently full of crazy parties, drugs, crazy parties, drugs, crazy parties, alcohol, crazy parties, drugs, and then sometimes they'd make a movie. And of course, that may be close to what the reality was. I wouldn't know because believe it or not, I wasn't there. But it's not just about what it's depicting, it's how Chazelle brings it to screen. These aren't just crazy parties, they are literally orgies of the senses, which Chazelle depicts using sweeping cameras, quick cuts, hundreds of extras, a cacophonous sound mix, and every vice you could possibly think of. You know this movie is set in the jazz age because several times during the movie, the camera pushes into or pulls out from a trumpet. And maybe Chazelle thought that he was presenting this version of old Hollywood as a dream or perhaps even a fever dream, but to me, it was often a nightmare. I'm just gonna cut it down to the quick. Less than five minutes into this movie, an elephant takes a big dump on somebody. And you don't just get like an impassive camera shot, you get a great POV shot of the person that's being dumped on so that you see the feces exiting the elephant and it's wet too, it's wet and brown and you just see the person covered in elephant poop. And then less than five minutes later, somebody gets peed on. And the only reason that that's not shocking is because you're still recovering from the shock of watching somebody get dumped on by an elephant just a few minutes before. This is probably the most extreme example of the overwhelming approach that Damien Chazelle takes to this movie. I don't know exactly what he wants to do, but it seems like for the first half of the movie, he's trying to paint this as an iconoclastic film, basically to break the idea that Hollywood was all class in the silent era, and that these were actually dirty, filthy, sleazy people. And that would be a fine thesis statement if Chazelle didn't completely change gears about halfway through the movie as we take the focus off of the crazy party atmosphere and onto the transition into the sound era from the silent film era. That transition was very difficult and it has been covered in other movies before this one. As a matter of fact, if Donald O'Connor in Singing in the Rain had tried to make him laugh by jumping into a pile of elephant poop, then this could perhaps have been tagged as a remake of that classic musical. Characters come and go throughout the film, but we largely follow Margot Robbie as Nellie Leroy, a young starlet whose willingness to do just about anything makes her the talk of Hollywood. We also follow Brad Pitt as Jack Conrad, an Errol Flynn type whose chronic alcoholism is only matched by his turbulent love life, and Diego Calva as Manny Torres, who climbs the ladder from elephant handler to aspiring executive. Gene Smart, Lucas Haas, Flea, Jeff Garland, Lee Jun Lee, PJ Byrne, and Spike Jones flit in and out of the film, as does Tobey Maguire in a role that is as bizarre as it is unnecessary to the movie. Damien Chazelle possesses an incredible technical acumen as a director, and I actually adored the last two movies that he did as writer-director, Whiplash and La La Land. He did not write the script for First Man, but I thought that the technical side of that movie was also incredibly well done. But I think that he really gets lost in the weeds here. This movie has some great parts, but it is mostly a messy jumble of I don't even know what. I guess I have to kind of tip my cap to the studio executive that gave Damien Chazelle reportedly $70 million plus in order to execute his vision. But maybe some Somebody should have asked him to go into a little bit more detail about what his vision was because it is really all over the place from the beginning of the film to where the movie ends, which I'll get to in just a few minutes. It's yet another example of a very talented director who, due to his previous success, was probably given very few checks and balances and a whole lot of resources and delivers something that actually probably needed a little more oversight. 
And I spent a lot of time trying to figure out exactly what this movie wanted to be. Is it a tawdry expose of the dirty Hollywood of the 1920s? Well, I guess it works okay on that front, maybe a little bit too well, but it doesn't stick with that for very long, or at least it kind of goes in and out. It's intermittent. Is this a quasi-historical account of the transition to talkies from silent films? We've seen that before in better films, although, as I mentioned, there are a couple of interesting scenes. Is this a character study? Well, it kind of is in parts, but we don't really delve enough into a lot of the characters to make it really matter. And there are a lot of other characters who we follow for quite some time whose stories don't really go anywhere. We've had filmmakers that have done big, sprawling cast stories. Filmmakers like Robert Altman have been able to pull this off. We've had filmmakers like Martin Scorsese who have done the party film, something like The Wolf of Wall Street, which is one of my favorite movies, and was able to pull that off. But there was a singular focus and a vision behind those films that this movie lacks in large part. What really sinks Babylon is the contradiction that I found at its core, which is that it seems like Giselle either feels or wants us to feel some kind of of nostalgia for this era of Hollywood that nobody almost really alive on this planet even remembers, and also an era that seems to make every one of the characters in this movie miserable. And it's all wrapped up in a coda that is jaw-dropping and not in a good way. I honestly could not believe that he chose to end the movie this way. It's, I guess, kind of an acknowledgement of the other films that have come before it, but then it spins off into an absolutely bananas editorial choice. I don't know whose job it was to push back against that choice, but they should have pushed back harder. And if nobody was pushing back against this choice, then somebody wasn't doing their job. It is completely out of sync with the rest of the film, and it is one of the more baffling movie endings that I've seen in a very long time. Speaking of endings, did I mention that Babylon is three hours long? Because it is a mere four minutes shorter than Avatar The Way of Water, and while it seeks to be as immersive as the James Cameron film, it really does not succeed on that front. Its inability to focus and conflicting tones make it a frustrating glimpse of what could have worked instead of a movie that does work. It's like Damien Chazelle shot two different movies and instead of releasing them separately, just decided to edit them all together into one film. There was apparently so much material to work with that one of the movie's signature trailer moments, that little dance that Brad Pitt does before he falls over the railing, isn't even in the film. <laughs> but I can't really place a lot of the blame on any of these actors. Pitt and Robbie in particular are standouts, and if the movie were better, I think that they would both be leading contenders for the Academy Awards. I do think that the technical team behind this film should and probably will be in contention. The sound design, the cinematography, editing, production design, and costumes are all first class and shouldn't bear the brunt of the other creative shortcomings. The score from Justin Hurwitz in in particular is exceptional work. But ultimately, Babylon does come up short, disappointingly short, because this was one of my most anticipated films of the year. I'm still a big fan of Damien Chazelle. I still think that he showed a lot of talent in Babylon, even though I don't think the movie succeeded as a whole, and I will continue to look forward to his next movie. This movie, however, much like the old Hollywood that it's depicting, is only able to stand up under the weight of its own excesses for so long before it collapses in on itself. So sadly, not a recommendation for me on Babylon. It is hitting theaters just in time for the the holidays. Maybe it'll do well at the box office. I don't know. It's it's one of those things. The awards movies in general this year, I've been trying to catch up on a lot of them as we get to the end of the year. It seems like every single movie that's in Oscar contention is between two hours and 45 minutes and three hours long. It really makes it tough to try to see as many as you can before the end of the year because I'm prepping my best and worst of the year list. And it's a really slow process this year because this has been a year of incredible length when it comes to movies and not a whole lot of them have earned that runtime. But what do you think? Do you mind long movies? I really don't mind them as long as they need to be long. I just didn't really think this one did need to be that long. Let me know down in the comments below and let me know what you're going to be doing for entertainment this Christmas besides hanging out with family and doing the holiday stuff. Thank you so much for watching and before we go I want to thank the sponsor for this review ExpressVPN. The holidays are here and we all love getting presents from family or friends or maybe even jolly old Saint Nick. What we don't want is some 
Grinch watching us, tracking our data, maybe even selling it to somebody else while we're online. ExpressVPN reroutes your internet connection through their secure servers so that your internet service provider and others can't see or log what you do online. Not only does this keep your ISP from tracking your data, it also makes sure that you're safe on public Wi-Fi networks during your holiday travels, whether you have a long layover or you're on an extended hotel stay. ExpressVPN also uses trusted server technology, which means that they're not logging your activity, and they're so confident in that claim that assurance firm PricewaterhouseCoopers has audited that technology. That's why ExpressVPN is rated the number one VPN by CNET, Wired, Tech Radar, and countless others. So if you want to make sure that your data is safely wrapped up this holiday season, go to expressvpn.com slash Merle right now, and you can get an extra three months of ExpressVPN for free. That's expressvpn.com slash Merle, expressvpn.com slash Merle to learn more. Thanks to ExpressVPN for sponsoring this review, and thank you for watching. I'll be back very soon with more movie news, reviews, box office, and more. Until next time, have safe holiday travels, and I'll see you then. Bye.